Tarka was drifting past the weir when he heard the whistle of White Tip beyond the hurdles. His head and shoulder rose out of the water. He listened. Hoo wee yik! White Tip answered him. Her cry was like wet fingers drawn over a pane of glass. Tarka's cry was deeper, more rounded and musical. He ran across the strip of wet sand, clambered over the hurdles and down to the lagoon. He touched water, and a ripple spread out from where he had disappeared. His seals in the sand crumpled as they welled water. Kaak! Old Nog croaked his excitement, for the salmon had leapt again, a glimmering curve. The teeth of White Tip clicked at its tail. Three otter heads bobbed flat as corks of a salmon net. They vanished before a double splash fell. The salmon passed through the cubs, cutting the water. They turned together. Tarka drove between them and slowed to their pace, keeping line. Then White Tip, who was faster than Tarka, overhauled them, and the old otters took the wings. The line swung out and in as each otter swam in zigzag. The eager cubs swam in each other's way. Once more the salmon rushed back against the current, straining through the top hurdles, where the water was deeper and safer. Tarka met it, and the thresh of its turning tail beat up splinters of water. The line of otters forced it into the shallow by the lower hurdles. They swam upon it, resting in two feet of water, but it escaped past one of the cubs. Salmon, feverish to spawn in the fresh waters of their birth, were running up the fairway, and with the flow came a seal, who tore a single bite from the belly of each fish it caught, and left it to chase others. Tarka brought one of the wounded fish to the rocks, and the otters scratched away scales in their haste to eat its pink flesh. They sliced from the shoulders, dropping pieces to feel the curd squeezed from the corners of their mouths. Tarka and White Tip ate quietly, but the cubs yinnered and snarled. Their faces were silvery with scales when they left the strewn bones. Being clean little beasts, they washed chins and whiskers and ears, and afterwards sought water to drink in the pond behind the seawall cottage. For two hours they chased and slew, and when every fish was killed, Tarka and White Tip stole away on the ebb to the sea, leaving the young otters to begin their own life. The next night was quiet and windless, without a murmur of water in the broad pool on which the lights of the village drew out like gold and silver eels. Sound travels far and distinct over placid water, and fishermen, standing in groups on the quay after the closing of the taverns, heard the whistling cries of the young otters a mile away on Crow Island, lost on the shingle where the ring plovers piped. They were heard for three nights, and then the southwest gale smote the place, and filled the estuary with great seas. November, December, January, February were past, but otters know only day and night, the sun and the moon. White Tip and Tarka had followed the salmon up the big river, but at the beginning of the new year they had come down again. Drifting with the ebb under Halfpenny Bridge, they crossed the marsh and came to the pool of the six herons. March winds brought the grey sea rains to the land, and the river ran swollen, bearing the floods of its brooks and runners. Oak and ash broke their buds and grew green. The buzzards repaired their old nests and laid their eggs. Splash, splatter, the bass were feeding in the weed on the stone, piling below the bridge end. Patter, patter, five dark shapes moving on the soft, wet sand of the pill's mouth. The pattering ceased, and the brook slurred its sand sounds, as they slid into the pool. White Tip had brought her four cubs from the Twin Ash Holt. Tarqual, the eldest cub, was following White Tip, for he liked to do his own hunting. A fish darted around the pier before White Tip and was taken by Tarqual. He ate it on the quicksand of the right bank, away from the cubs. The sharp point of the back fin pricked his mouth. Every night for a week the otters came to the pool at low water until the tides, ebbing later and later and so into daylight, stopped the fishing. One evening, when the peel rock in the river below Canal Bridge was just awash after a thunderstorm, Tarka and White Tip and the four cubs followed a run of peel as far as the weir pool. Tarkwal swam near Tarka. 
The cub was lithe and swift as his parent, and sometimes snatched fish from his mouth. They rolled and romped together, clutching rudders and heads and pretending to bite. Their joyful whistles went far down the river, heard by old Nog as he sailed by in the wasting moonlight. Paler the moon rose, and at dawn White Tip went down with the cubs, and Taka wandered on alone. But he turned back again, calling her to Canal Bridge to play one last game. Hoo-wee yik! They played the old bridge game of the West Country Otters, which was played before the Romans came. They played around the upper and lower cutwater of the middle pier, while the lesser stars were crowned in the heavenly tide flowing up the eastern sky, and the trees of the hill lane grew dark, and larks were flying with song. Hoo-wee yik! Tarqual followed Tarka out of the river and along the otter path across the bend, heedless of his mother's call. He followed up the river and across another bend, but, scared of the light, returned to water and sought a holt under a sycamore. Tarka went on alone up three miles of river to a holt in a weir pool shadowed by trees where peel were leaping. The sun looked over the hills. The moon was as a feather dropped by the owl flying home and Tarka slept while the water flowed, and he dreamed of a journey with Tarqual down to a strange sea where they were never hungry and never hunted. At half-past ten in the morning, a covered motor van stopped at the bridge below the dark pool. From the driver's seat, three men got down, and at the sound of their footfalls, deep notes came from the van. Huntsman and his whipper in each lifted a rusty pin from the staples in the back of the van, and lowered the flap. Immediately, hounds fell out and over each other, and to the road, shaking themselves, whimpering, panting with pink tongues flacking. The kennel boy and whip called them by name, and flicked gently near the more restless with his whip. Barbrook and Bellman, Boisterous and Chorister, Dewdrop, Sailorous, Coraline and Waterwitch. Armlet, who lay down to sleep, Playboy and Actor, Render and Fencer, Hemlock, the one-eyed, with Blue Maid, Hurricane, Harper, and Pitiful, the veterans. Darnell and Grinder, who sat behind Sandboy. Then two young hounds of the same litter, Dabster and Dauntless, sons of Dewdrop and Deadlock. And there, Deadlock, his black head scarred with old fights, sat on his haunches, apart and morose, watching for the yellow waistcoat of the master. His right ear showed the mark made by the teeth of Tarka's mother two years before, when he had thrust his head into the hollow of the fallen tree. The swung thong of the whip idly flicked near Deadlock. He moved his head slightly in his eyes. From upper and lower teeth the lips were drawn, and looking at the kennel boy's legs, Deadlock growled. The hound hated him. Shortly after half-past ten o'clock, Eleven and a half couples of hounds and two terriers, nearly throttling themselves in eagerness to press forward, were trotting behind the huntsman through the farmyard to the river. They jumped down the bank into the river, leaping across the shallows to the left bank and working upstream to the occasional toot of the horn. Almost at once, Deadlock whimpered and bounded ahead. Tarka had touched there on the shillets six hours before. By a briar raking the water, the otter's head was raised. He listened and swam to the bank. Hounds spoke remotely. He knew Deadlock's tongue among them. His scent was washed down by the water, and the hounds followed him. He crept out on the other bank on soft ground littered with dead leaves, which lay under crooked oak trees. He ran swiftly up the slope and entered Dark Ham's wood, listening through the remote sough of the wind in the branches to the faint cries. For nearly twenty minutes he waited, and then the hunting cries swelled in the narrow groves of the wood. Sunlight dazzled him when he ran out of the plantation. Then he saw many men and women before him. Tally-ho! Tarka ran round them and dived into the leet. When first he had swum down, the water had brimmed to the meadow, floating the green plants in its slow-gliding current. Now the bank glistened with a sinking watermark and only the tags of the starwort were waving. Trout darted before him as he swam against the water flowing faster. 
Taka became one with the river, finding his course among the slimy stones so that his back was always covered. He lay so still that the trout returned to their stances beside the stone stirlings. Boys, boys, come on, old fellas, you in, old fellas, come on, all of you. Taka swam to the left bank where he touched and breathed. Then he swam under an arch, turned by the lower stirling, and swam up another arch to a backwater secluded from the main stream by the ridge of shillets made by the cross-leaping waters of the runner in flood. An ash tree grew over the backwater, but Tarka could find no holding in its roots. He swam past the legs of the swimming hounds and went down again. Tally-ho! A thousand yards from Taddyport Bridge, he passed the brook up which he had travelled with his mother on the way to the clay pits. He swam under a railway bridge, below which the river hurried in a course narrow and shaded. An island of elm trees divided the river bed. The right fork was dry. Hawkweed, ragwork and St John's wort, plants of the land, were growing there. Tarka swam to the tail of the island and climbed up the dry bank. He had been lying among the cool and stinking garlic plants of Elm Island for nearly five minutes when he heard gasping and wheezing noises at the top of the island. The two terriers, Bytum and Biff, were pulling at their chains, held by the kennel boy. Their tongues hung long and limp after the two-mile tug from the mills over sun-baked turf, dusty trackway and hot stones to Elm Island. Just before, while tugging down the path, Bytum had fainted with the heat. A lapping sprawl in the river had refreshed the couple, and now they strove against the collars, pressing into their windpipes. Tarka started up when they were a yard from where he lay. The kennel boy dropped the chain when he saw him. Tarka ran towards the river, but at the sheer edge of the island he saw men on the stones six feet below. He ran along the edge, quickening at the shout of the kennel boy, and had almost reached the island's tail when Bytum pinned him in the shoulder. Tissing through his open mouth, Tarka rolled and fought with the terriers. Their teeth clenched. Tarka's moves were low and smooth. He bit Bytum again and again, but the terrier hung on. Biff tried to bite him across the neck, but Tarka writhed away. The three rolled and snarled, scratching and snapping, falling apart and returning with instant swiftness. Ears were torn and hair ripped out. Hounds heard them and ran baying under the island cliff to find a way up. The kennel boy tried to stamp on and recover the end of the chain, for he knew that in a worry all three might be killed. White terriers and brown otter rolled nearer the edge and fell over. The fall shook off Bytum. Tarka ran under the legs of Dabster, and although Blue Maid snapped at his flank, he got into the water and sank away. Tally-ho! Tally-ho! Yah-ee! On to em. A quarter of a mile below Rothen Bridge, the river slows into the lower loop of a great S. It deepens until halfway when the S is cut by the weir, holding back the waters of the Long Bean Pool. Tarka reached the top of the pool. He swam under the outer roots of a sycamore tree and was climbing in a dim light to a dry upper ledge when a tongue licked his head and teeth playfully nipped his ear. Two pale yellow eyes moved over him. He had come upon the cub, Tarkwal. Tarkwal, the hairs of his neck raised, was listening at the back of the ledge. He was still as a root. The ground was shaking. Go in on him, old fellas. Wind him, my lads. Boys, boys, come on, boys. Get on to him. Tarkwal tissed, moving to and fro in fear of the great noises. Tarka rolled over and swam out of the holt. Tarkwal followed him. He saw Tarka's chain rising bright before him. He turned upstream and was alone. Seventy yards from the holt, he rose under the bank to rest and heard the baying of the hounds. He dived again and went on upstream at his greatest speed. At his next vent, he knew that the terrible beasts were following him. He swam out of the pool, turned back again, saw their heads in the water from bank to bank, became scared, and left the river. He gained three hundred yards before the hounds found his line again. He ran with the sun behind him for two hundred yards over grass, then he turned and went through a thorn hedge, climbed the railway embankment, and ran up over Firsbeam Hill, leaving an irregular trail. He ran for three miles on land, 
hiding among the dry spikes of gorse and under branches. Sometimes he mewed in his misery. Hounds ran far ahead of the men and women. Eventually the pack hunted him back to the railway line to where he was crouching low in the thorn hedge. A bird with a loud, rasping voice and a beak bent like an iron nail clacked and chattered on a briar rising out of the hedge. It was a bird of property, or red-backed shrike, and Tarqual was squatting by its larder of bumblebees, grasshoppers, and young harvest mice impaled on thorns. The mice were dead, but the bees still moved their legs. Tarqual ran out of the thorns just before Render's muzzle pushed into his hiding place, but Hans leapt the low hedge and overtook him before he had gone very far on his short, tired legs. Deadlock seized him and shook him and threw him into the air. Tarqual sprang up as soon as he fell, snapping and writhing as more jaws bit on his body, crushed his head, cracked his ribs, his paws and his rudder. Among the brilliant hawk bits, little sunflowers of the meadow, he was picked up and dropped again, trodden on and wrenched and broken, while the screaming cheers and hoops of sportsmen mingled with the growling rumble of hounds at worry. Tarqual fought them until he was blinded and his jaws were smashed. He had gone home before Tarka. Meanwhile, Tarka, swimming out of a sycamore holt, had turned to deeper water. Where the river's bend began to straighten again, the right bank lay under oak trees growing on the hill slope to the sky. He made a hidden crossing to listen under cover of flag lilies for more than a minute. The river was quiet. He heard the sound of falling water and swam slowly down after touching under the bank. He passed under the middle arch of the railway bridge and reached the weir slanting across the river. The summer water tumbled down the fish pass but glided thin as a snail shell over the top end of the concrete sill. The lower end by the fender at the head of the leet was dry. Tarka walked along the sill nearly to the end, which was two inches above the level of the pool. He stretched his weary back on the warm concrete and sprawled in the sun. He lay basking for more than an hour. Warm and brilliant sun flickers on the shallows below dazed his eyes and made him drowsy. But when a hound working along the left bank climbed on the sill by the pass and shook himself, he was instantly alert. Tucker felt neither fear nor rage against the hound. He wanted to be left alone. After several hidden swims from bank to bank and finding no holding where he might lie up and sleep until evening, he walked out by a cattle-trodden grove in the right bank and ran away over land. He followed the otter path across a quarter of a mile of meadow and came to the river again by the third oak above Canal Bridge. Tarka drifted under the high, lime-spiky arches of the bridge, and the white owl, roosting on a ledge below the parapet, beside the brows of a dog rose growing there with hawkweeds, saw him going downstream. Then the pack came down, and many men, and the owl was driven into wavy flight down the river. It pitched in the tree of Leaning Willow Island as a dull clamour broke out half a mile up the river. Hounds had marked the otter under a hover and driven him out. Tarka swam until he was forced to vent, which he did at the river verge under the banks or by clumps of yellow flags. Sometimes he crept on the stones, hiding himself under overhanging roots as he sought a refuge, until, dreading the nearness of hounds, he slipped into the river again, covered with a silver skin of air. As he swam, twin streams of bubbles came out of his nostrils, raced over his head and neck, and shook off his back to lie on the surface in a chain, watched by many eyes. Up and down the pool he went, swimming in midstream or near the banks, crossing from side to side, and varying his depth of swimming as he tried to get away from his pursuers. Passing under the legs of hounds, he saw them joined to their broken surface images. From underwater he saw men and women pointing with hand and pole as palsied and distorted shapes on the bank. However hard he swam with his three and a half webs, always he heard the hounds, as they spoke to his scent, lying in burst bubble, in seal on muddy scour, on leaf and twig. Once in mid-river, while on his way to a clump of flags, his breath gave out, and he bobbed up to breathe a yard from deadlock. He stared into the eyes of his old enemy and dived. 
During 40 seconds, he swam a distance of 70 yards to a bed of reeds where he breathed and rested. No one saw him, but they saw the chain of bubbles. Up the river again, past the Peel Rock, and under the middle arch of the canal bridge to the shallow, crossed by a line of men and women standing close together. Tally-ho! He turned and reached covering water just before Hans. Get on to him! Lew on! Lew on! Wind him, old fellas! Tarka went down river, but a blurred and brilliant colour band stretched from bank to bank above leaning Willow Island. He tried to get through, but stockinged leg was pressed to stockinged leg, a fixed barrier behind playing poles. Tarka turned and swam upstream again, leaving hounds behind. For five minutes he rested under a thorn bush. Deadlock found him, and on he went to Canal Bridge once more, where he lay in the water, weary after the long chase. The tongues swelled under the bridge. He was nearly picked up by Hurricane, the Irish staghound but the blunted canine teeth couldn't hold him. The chain became shorter. Tarka was too weary to seek a holding in the banks. He breathed in view of his enemies. Seven and a half couples of hounds swam in the pool, their sterns throwing behind them arc lines of drops on the surface. Others splashed in the shallows under the banks. The huntsmen let them work by themselves. During the sixth hour, the otter disappeared. The river grew quiet. People not in uniform sat down on the grass. The huntsman was wading slowly upstream, feeling for foothold with pole and keeping an eye on deadlock. For more than an hour, the sun throngs flickered across the placid water. A fallen bough of willow lay in the pool near one bank, and Taka lay beside it. His rudder held a sunken branch. Only his wide upper nostrils were above water. He never moved. The wading huntsman prodded Peel Rock and the rock above it. Hounds sat on the banks, shivering and watching Deadlock, Render and Harper working the banks. At the beginning of the eighth hour, a scarlet dragonfly whirred and darted over the willow snag, watched by a girl sitting on the bank. Her father, an old man, lank and humped as a heron, was looking out near her. She watched the dragonfly settle on what looked like a piece of bark beside the snag. She heard a sneeze and saw the otter's whiskers scratch the water. Glancing round, she realised that she alone had seen the otter. She flushed and hid her grey eyes with her lashes. Since childhood she had walked the Devon rivers with her father, looking for flowers and the nests of birds, passing some rocks and trees as old friends, seeing a spirit everywhere, gentle in thought to all her eyes beheld. For two minutes the maid sat silent, hardly daring to look at the river. The dragonfly flew over the pool, seizing flies and tearing them apart in its horny jaws. Her father watched it as it settled on the snag, rose up, circled, and lit on the water, it seemed. Tarka sneezed again, and the dragonfly flew away. A grunt of satisfaction from the old man, a brown hand and wrist holding aloft a hat, a slow intake of breath, and... Tally-ho! Tarka dived when the hounds came down, and the chain showed where he had swum. Many saw his dark, sleek form as he walked by the edge of a grassy islet by the twelve trees. The hounds ran to him and Tarka turned and faced them, squatting on his short hind legs, his paws close against his round and sturdy chest. He bit Render in the nose, making his teeth meet. In an instant he drew back, tissing and bit Deadlock in the flues. The narrow lower jaw snapped again and again, until the press of hounds hid him from sight. He squirmed away through legs and underbellies, biting and writhing away to the water, and the chain drew out on the surface of the pool, while hounds were still seeking him on the stones where he had sat and faced them. Lew on, then! Lew on, then! Over! Tarka's pace was slow, and his dives were short. In the water by the Peel Rock he lay, glancing at the faces along the banks, across the river and in the river. His small, dark eyes showed no feeling. He turned away from the human faces to watch the coming of the hounds. He was calm and fearless and fatigued. 
When they were his length away, he swung under, showing the middle of his smooth back level with the surface, and swimming past their legs. He saw the huntsman's legs before him joined to the image of legs, and above the inverted image a flattened and uncertain head and shoulders. Up and down he swam, slower and slower. At the beginning of the ninth hour, an immense fatigue came over him, greater than his fatigue when, in the long, hard winter, he had lived for over a month on seaweed and shellfish in the estuary. The water seemed to thicken at each thrust of his webs. He ceased to swim and drifted backwards, looking at the huntsman wading nearer. For ten minutes he rested between dives of only a few yards, and then he rolled from Deadlock's bite and went downstream. He swam with his last strength, for upon him had come the penultimate desire of the hunted otter, the desire that comes when water ceases to be a refuge, the desire to tread again the land tracks of his ancestors. He crawled half up the bank, but turned back at the thudding of many feet. The sideway ply of a pole in a turmoil of water struck him on the head. He pushed past the iron point, but it was brought down on his shoulder to hold him against the shillets. Deadlock bore down on him and pulled him back by the rudder. Amidst the harsh cries of men and women and the heavy tongues of hounds, Tarka was overborne by the pack. The master looked at his watch. Eight hours and forty-five minutes from the find in the dark pool. Then the screeching, yarring yell of one of the honorary whips. For again, Tarka had escaped from the worry and had merged into the narrow stream of water that hurried to Leaning Willow Island. Below the island, the river widened, smooth with the sky. Tarka swam down slowly, bleeding from many wounds. Sometimes he paddled with three legs, sometimes with one, in the water darkening so strangely before his eyes. Not always did he hear the hounds baying around him, at the beginning of the tenth hour he passed the banks faced with stone to keep the sea from the village and drifted into deeper water whereon sticks and froth were floating. Hounds were called off by the horn, for the tide was in flood. But as they were about to leave, Tarka was seen again, moving with the tide, his mouth open. The flow took him near the bank. He kicked feebly and rolled over. Tally ho! Deadlock saw the small brown head and bayed in triumph as he jumped down the bank. He bit the head and lifted the otter high, flung him about and fell into the water with him. They saw the broken head look up beside Deadlock, heard the cry of Ikyang as Tarka bit into his throat, and then the hound was sinking with the otter into the deep water. Oak leaves, black and rotting in the mud of the unseen bed, arose and swirled and sank again, and the tide slowed still and began to move back, and they waited and watched until the body of Deadlock arose, drowned and heavy, and floated away amidst the froth on the waters. They pulled the body out of the river and carried it to the bank, laying it on the grass and looking down at the dead hound in sad wonder. And while they stood there silently, a great bubble rose out of the depths and broke. And as they watched, another bubble shook the surface and broke. And there was a third bubble in the sea-going waters and nothing more.